Hello class. Welcome back to your class on Bible Survey 2. So this is the class that we are talking about the intertestamental period. Okay, so we have already done two lectures about the intertestamental period. This is our third lecture on the intertestamental period. So we have already covered the initial uh, initial periods or in the initial initial times of the intertestamental period. We have covered uh, the part of Alexander the Great, the Greek uh, rule and the Hellenism, the spread of Hellenism and uh, how uh, Alexander the Great had spread and, uh, uh, you know, captured and, uh, and extended his territory and how he imposed uh, or Hellenized everything and, and what were his strategies and everything we have already uh, studied in the first part. The second part, we were talking about the Maccabean revolt and rule where we saw that how uh, Matthias, uh, he was the person, uh, he was a priest and he was the person who led a revolt, who began a revolt, I would say, who ignited uh, that fire of revolt and with his family, uh, he moved on to the hills and then we also saw how his sons carried on the revolt and then they achieved a religious freedom and then they achieved political freedom also gradually and then we also see how uh, that the corruption took place among the priesthood also and we also saw uh, how the, 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 the battle between the Seleucids and Ptolemies they that uh, stopped and how we can see that the Seleucids continued and then gradually we see that uh, the Roman kingdom entered so in the last class in the last portion we had seen that Pompey had entered and there was a power struggle among the priests okay the priests of the Jewish community at that time and we were seeing that that struggle was taking place among Aristobulus and uh, Hyrcanus and uh, we, we saw that Pompey came in between and he stopped that fight. So he sided one of the groups. So we will see, we will move ahead now and we will enter into the Roman uh, part or the Roman rule. Okay, so to, today or uh, in this lecture, we are going to talk about the Roman rule. So we will also see some things about the Herods also. Okay, so the Roman rule, we'll talk about the Roman rule because we know when uh, Jesus was there or we, when we start with the New Testament, when we start with the study of the New Testament and when the transition takes place from the Old to the New Testament, suddenly we see that the kingdom has changed. Okay, the kingdom has changed from the Medo Persian to the Roman Empire. So we have already done the initial part or initial period of the intertestamental period. So now this is towards the end of the intertestamental period. So this is the beginning of the Roman Empire that we are going to study today. This is the third part of uh, the intertestamental period lecture. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so let me share the screen for the benefit of you who are taking notes so that you can. Uh, view uh, the lectures and you can read the notes as and follow the notes as I lecture and you can take down the notes. Okay, so this is lesson 20, continuation of lesson 20. This is the historical survey of the intertestamental period part three. Okay, so this is the last part or the fifth part and this is the Roman conquest and rule in Judah. So we have to understand that now we are going to talk about the Roman kingdom and how they function. So Italy, Italy was basically the uh, the main the main part of Roman where uh, the rule came from. The rulers dwell in kind of a capital, you can say. Okay, so Italy had independent cities. Okay, Italy had independent cities earlier. Okay, all the whole nation of Italy it was it was independent cities earlier in 200 uh, BC. Cities became together as one state and Rome became its chief city. Okay, so we have to understand that the, uh, Italy, uh, Italy is a place, uh, Italy is a place and uh, it was independent states earlier, but gradually it became into one nation, one state, and then Rome became its capital or Rome became its chief city. Okay, so Senate. Uh, ruled the nation. So there was a senator group of people who ruled the nation. Each city was free in its function, judiciary and tax. Romans moved eastward and northward. So they moved eastward and northward basically to conquer the other nations and uh, expand their rule. So there were two major generals of the Roman Empire. One was Pompey, whom we have already discussed in the last class. So Pompey, he, he was in charge of the Eastern Empire and he conquered Syria and Israel. Julius Caesar was the other general uh, who 
was uh, ruling towards the Western Empire and the European side. Pompey imposed new order in Roman style to liquidate the Seleucid kingdom. So when we, we uh, in the last class, we saw that Pompey had started his rule over the Israelite kingdom and the Seleucids were ruling at that time and he cut off the Seleucid kingdom at that time and he overpowered them. And we see now that Pompey had started to impose a new style of uh, policy, a new style of polity or a new style of, uh, of, of rule. So it was a Roman style of ruling and he did that, he imposed that so that he could you know, disqualify or he could just finish off the Seleucid kingdom. So he sent his legate M. Aemilius Carius to Syria in 65 BC. Okay, uh, Aristobulus was imprisoned after that and Jerusalem tried to protect themselves from, the, from Pompey, but they gave up and opened the gates for Romans. Okay, so people around the temple resisted strongly. So the people who lived around the temple and who were supporting the temple and who were a very religious group of people, they opposed uh, this uh, entrance of the Romans strongly. But Pompey took three months of siege in that area. Okay, so he put a siege or he besieged uh, that area of Jerusalem for around three months. Many Jews were massacred by the Romans in this struggle. Approximately 12,000 Jews were killed. 63 BC, Pompey reorganized Syria and Judea. He appointed M. Aemilius Scarius, Scarus uh, as the first governor of Syria and Judea. He was lenient. He was very lenient towards this Aemilius. He was very lenient towards the Jews. And he gave orders to resume sacrificial system. And he allowed, basically he allowed uh, the Jews uh, to continue their sacrificial system. Hyrcanus too was made the high priest. Antipater, the governor of Idumbia, he influenced Hyrcanus's rule. So the way Hyrcanus was dealing with his priesthood, uh, it was, he was quite influenced by Antipater, who was the governor of Idumbia. Two revolts of Aristobulus were put down by the Rome. So uh, though uh, we can say that Aristobulus was opposing Hyrcanus, if you want to remember, uh, they were uh, they were opposition, they, though they were brothers, they were opposites, and they were having a lot of conflicts to usurp the position or get the powerful position. So now because Hyrcanus was put into the position of high priest, uh, Aristobulus started uh, revolting. Okay, so he revolted two times uh, against the Romans, but the Romans were victorious and they put his revolts down. In the third revolt, Jewish territory was divided into five independent districts under the Syrian province. Okay, so the after the third revolt, we can see that the city or the uh, or the nation of the Jews it was broken down and it was divided into five provinces. Uh, 55 BC, Antipater, the governor of Edumbia, if you remember, he became the Roman procurator or the representative of Jerusalem. There was internal conflict which arose in Rome. Okay, there was disagreement now between Pompey and Julius Caesar. If you remember just now, we said that there were two generals, one ruling the east, another ruling the west. Pompey ruled the east and Julius Caesar was ruling the west. But now there were certain disagreements between Pompey and Julius Caesar. There was conflict among the rulers of Rome. So Julius Caesar defeated Pompey in Thessalonica in 48 BC and became the emperor. Antipater switched parties. Now Antipater was earlier with Pompey, but now he switched parties because Antipater, because we can see that Pompey was defeated by Julius Caesar. So he sided Julius Caesar now and he supported him. He uh, The rebuilding of the walls were allowed under Julius Caesar. Taxes were reduced. Exemption, were, exemption from the military services was also allowed. He favored Jews, okay? So he favored Jews, but they hated him for he was an Edomite. So this is, we are talking about Antipater because Antipater was ruling or uh, in a way in charge of the whole Judean territory. So he he favored, uh, he uh, though he was from Edomia, he was an Edomite from the tribe of Esau, okay? But so he favored the Jews, but they hated him for he was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau. So they were hated, he was hated by the Jews. The second internal conflict led to the murder of Caesar on Ides on March 44 BC. Few members of the Senate were also involved in killing Caesar in that time. 
civil war broke out between Mark Anthony and the murderer. So the member of the Senate. Okay, so Mark Anthony is a member of the Senate. So civil war broke out between Mark Anthony, who was siding Caesar, and the other murderers. So in 43 BC, Jews poisoned Antipater also, who was an Edo from Edumbia, and Mark Anthony took charge. So we can see that Caesar is killed by his own Senate people. Mark Anthony uh, starts uh, starts uh, taking uh, taking charge of it, and he uh, rebels against, or he speaks, or he you know breaks out against the murderers. And then we see soon, within a year, we see that Antipater, who is in charge of the Judean territory, he also dies. He's also poisoned. And now Mark Anthony, the Senate member, he took he takes charge and he starts ruling. He appointed Faisal and Herod, the sons of Antipater, as the tetrarchs, the ruler of one fourth, one of the four divisions, and made Hyrcanus as the high priest. Hyrcanus too, jealous, he was jealous of Herod, Herod the son of Antipater, and he summoned him before the Sanhedrin. And when he appeared with an army, and then he appeared with an army to threaten Jerusalem. In 40 BC, the son of Aristobulus too attempted to win back the throne again from the resentment of from Hyrcanus. Okay, so he cut off Hyrcanus's ear to make him unfit for priesthood and imprisoned him and Faisal. So you you have to understand that if you have uh, a, a, you know a body cut or some kind of imperfection or some kind of you know uh, some kind of problem in your body, you cannot continue as a priest or a high priest in the temple. So Aristobulus too, he he had, in his attempt to win back the position of high priest or the throne, he cut off Hyrcanus's ear to make him um, to make him uh, not fit for priesthood. Okay, and he and uh, imprisoned him and Faisal. Faisal committed suicide in prison. Herod escaped and reached Rome. Hyrcanus was taken to Babylon by the Parthians. Antigonus, another person comes up. Antigonus was made king of Jerusalem. He ruled for three years from 40 BC to 37 BC. And a new king in Maccabean line uh, was found now in Antigonus. So if you remember the Maccabean uh, line or lineage, so he belongs to Maccabean lineage and we see that it comes back, that lineage is coming back and Antigonus becomes a new king in the Maccabean line. He was supported by the Sadducees, aristocrats, but three years later, he was dislodged by the Roman army and he was brought by Herod, executed in Antioch. Let's move ahead. Let's talk about the Herods because we know that at the time of birth of Jesus, there was Herod, okay, Herod ruling, and he was a person who uh, who passed a decree or who passed a command where all the boys under the age of two were supposed to be killed because he was afraid that a new king is rising. So Herod dislodged Antigonus, who was a Maccabean, if you remember, just now we said in 47 BC and executed by. 45, he executed, he, uh, uh, executed 45 Sadducees aristocratic priests. Roman senators Octavian and Mark Anthony appointed him as the king of Judea. So now Antigonus becomes the king of Judea. He took up kingship in 37 BC and became the ethnarch of the Judean territory. Jews did not favor him as he was Edomian. Again, Edomian means he was from Edom or he was the descendant of Esau. So they did, those of the Jews did not like him. So he was supported by Hyrcanus II, who allowed him to marry his daughter, Miriam, which made him a relative of the high priest family. He was a strong ruler, but he was distracted by his family dispute. His family had a lot of controversies, a lot of disputes. So because of that, he was distracted a lot, but he was a good leader. His mother-in-law, Alexandra, had a grudge against Herod. And because he became the king instead of her son, Aristobulus III, she was very, very upset. She pressurized Miriam, his wife, or the, uh, as we have said, he, she was, he, Herod was married to him. Uh, Herod was married to her. And uh, Miriam and Cleopatra were pressurized by the mother-in-law of Herod uh, who was Cleopatra. Now, Cleopatra was the queen of the Ptolemaic kingdom or the Egyptians. Okay, so both were pressurized by the mother-in-law of Herod. Uh, and uh, she said that uh, they should pressurize Mark Anthony to convince 
uh, Herod to make Aristobulus three as the high priest and remove Ananel. Okay, so she wanted her son to be the high priest. So she pressurizes, pressurizes her daughter. She pressurizes the queen of Ptolemies, Cleopatra, so that they can pressurize Mark Anthony, who is ruling the territory right now, to convince that Aristobulus three should become the high priest and Ananel should be removed. Okay, uh, finally, Aristobulus three was made the high priest, which calmed down the tensions between Herod and Alexandra. Aristobulus drowned while bathing, for which Herod was suspected, and by uh, suspected and by Alexandra and Cleopatra. Hence, uh, pressurized Mark Anthony to call him to Rome. So, when Aristobulus tried uh, drowned, and uh, it is said that Aristobulus was drowned in his bathtub while taking bath. Okay, so he was drowned, and all the blame of his death came upon Herod because Herod did not want him to become the high priest. Okay, so they all suspected Herod, and then Herod was called upon. He, uh, Alexander called Alexander and Cleopatra. They both called Herod uh, to Rome so that he could present and he could be presented before the court and he could present his case of uh, defense. So while he was away, he placed his wife and Alexandria under his uncle Joseph's care. Hearing the rumor of Herod's death, so he came comes to know that probably Herod has died. So hearing the rumor of Herod's death, uh, Alexandria tried to take Alexandra tried to take the throne. Okay, so she thought that my husband is dead, or Alexa, sorry, uh, my son-in-law is dead. So she tries to take, or she tries to usurp the throne of the Herod. But Herod had not died. So Herod returns. He was furious to know uh, what all is happening. Uh, in his absence, he was furious to know that Alexandra and his wife unfaithfulness. Uh, she was Alexandra was unfaithful uh, to his son to her to her son-in-law, and we can see that his wife, she Miriam, we can say she was also unfaithful to him with uh, the uncle or with the person whom he had kept her uh, for security. Uh, that is Joseph. So he arrested Alexandra and executed Joseph without trial. Herod leaves Mark Anthony and he pledges friendship with Octavian, who defeated Mark Anthony in 31 BC, who became the emperor Augustus. Augustus. Okay, so uh, we can see that Octavian, uh, uh, we can see that now uh, Herod becomes Emperor Augustus. Herod was given Samaria and Transjordan from Cleopatra's territory. Herod returns to Jodia in 29th BC and he was suspicious of his wife with her guard, Sohimus, and executed both of them along with Alexandra. So there is a lot of, you know, uh, this unfaithful, uh, being unfaithfulness, uh, this family conflict going on. And in the most of the cases, you will see that Alexandra is involved, his mother-in-law. So in 25 BC, he executed his sister's husband for hiding sons of Babas or Hasmoneans. Okay, so he executed all who threatened his position. So whoever, whoever was trying, he was so he had become so suspicious because even his family members were, you know, uh, his family members were uh, kindly, uh, mainly secretly revolting against him or trying to usurp the position. And so he, what he was doing is whoever would come against him or who would, whoever would disagree with him or whoever was was there threatening his position or his throne, he killed them or he executed all of them. So there was a constant tension between Herod and the Jews. He tried to appease, appease the Jews. He tried to please the Jews by following their faith. He also favored the Pharisees. He helped in rebuilding the temple in 20 BC. Okay, uh, the temple, if you remember, the temple was built or rebuilt uh, uh, in the 20 BC by Herod, but he did not succeed in appeasing or pleasing the Jewish people. The third group of people, or uh, the third group of Jews, the Herodians, did support him, but the main sect of the Jews did not support him. Jews did not like him as he was again an Edomian from the tribe of Esau, from Edomia, uh, or Edom, as you can, as you would like to say. And Greeks did not like him either as he was as he was a Jew, okay, as he was a Jew. So uh, executions by him led to more of his unpopularity. So he was not liked by the Jew because, a bit loyal by the Jews because he was a descendant of Esau uh, or from Edomia. And the Greeks did not like him because he was a Jew. 
so he was very unpopular because he was trying to protect his position from all who were trying to uh, usurp his position yet we can say that he brought a, teeth, a time of peace he brought money he brought business and he brought building projects in his time so he was excellent in that position he was excellent in in leading he was excellent in dealing he was excellent in bringing finances and he maintained peace because of his activeness okay he he built excellent harbors in caesarea he built temple to augustus and enlarged samaria uh, he set up a military fortress in masada a, he built a palace a theater and amphitheater in jerusalem he strengthened old fortress at acra he renamed it antonio in honor of mark antony he restored and enlarged jerusalem temple in 20 bc and covered it with gold the work was completed only in 63 bc which was destroyed in 70 ad later on uh, he rebuilt the samaritan temple at gerizim in 25 bc which hyrcanus had destroyed okay so so many things he had been doing he exempted poor from taxation during famine in 24 23 bc jobs were offered in building projects and relief work he appointed his own people in government and rejected hereditary priesthood that was something that he shouldn't have done because the jews uh, they believed in uh, the priesthood among the levites and the, the family of priests he had 10 wives and 15 children all full of hatred jealousy quarrels suspicions and intrigues which led to a lot of conflict and scheming within the family so there were a lot of family conflict among the wives among the children and among all the family members which actually kept him uh, uh, quite distracted from you know focusing on the ruling the kingdom herod was seriously ill he suffered greatly mentally and physically most of it could have been because of the family issues because of the conflict in the family so he was struggling he was quite ill and mentally he became quite ill and physically also it caused him illness he died in 44 bc sorry he died in 4 bc he changed uh, his will three times in this time uh, because he was uh, quite unstable because he could not trust uh, his own family members he changed his will three times and in the final will uh, he mentioned a few names and uh, responsibilities he mentions archelaus as the king of judea antipas as tetrarch of cali and transjordan philip as tetrarch of uh, golantis and trancotis and penes so uh, we see with this, uh, this with this we can see that uh, herod came uh, comes into being and this is the time when jesus is born and this is the time we can see where uh, all these things are happening and this is the time where the new testament begins and now we know who the pharisees are now we know who the sadducees are now we know who the essenes are now we know how herods came into being now we know how the roman kingdom came into being and what all happened in the period between the between the new testament and the old testament so the apocryphal books or the book of maccabean the extra, the extra books that we have we are going to study about it in the next chapter so we get a lot of history about this intertestamental period a period where god was silent the prophecies had ceased so this was the period where god did not speak and the jews believe that god did not speak in this period so it was a period of silence from god a period of dark age there was no prophecy but this is the period where a lot of things take took place a lot of history took place a lot of changes took place uh, it was there was if there was no books telling us about uh, the intertestamental period we could not have known how the transition took place from the old testament period or scenario or background uh, and how we get into the roman kingdom and why there was a conflict between the samaritans and why there was a conflict between uh, the jews and the samaritans and why there's a conflict between the sadducees and the pharisees and why all these issues were there uh, and why uh, herod became uh, an eso uh, an edomite how did he become a ruler and how did the roman kingdom come into being so uh, this intertestamental period gives us a lot of knowledge and helps us to understand 
what all happened in this period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, how these all transitions took place. It talks about the Hellenism, why Greek came into being, why Old Testament was translated into, uh, into, into, into the Greek language or Septuagint. Okay, so all those knowledge, all this knowledge we get from the intertestamental period. So it is very important that we understand it so that we can understand the background of the New Testament. Okay, so this is all for the intertestamental period. Uh, and uh, it, uh, I would request you all to take notes. I would request you all to view it, understand the history so that you may be able to understand uh, the background of the New Testament, which we are going to enter into very soon. Thank you, class. Uh, God bless you. Take care.